Good afternoon. How y'all? How y'all doing today? Good. How are you? Always good one way or another. Thank you for asking. You're welcome. Uh, welcome to the Warren Officer um, Career Panel. Uh, we'll be discussing um, talent acquisition, retention, and utilization in a dynamic and fluid Army environment. Um, we're going to go over a couple rules of engagement before we start. Um, each of the panel members will have three minutes to talk about themselves or anything else they want, and then we will start getting into questions. Um, uh, if you want to know their full bios, the AFCA website has their entire full bios on it. Their names and positions can be seen up on the screen. Um, we have CW5 Brian Matthews, CW5 Chris Restbook, CW5 Chris Everson, CW4 Reba Walner, and CW5 Ramil Francisco. Um, I'll start off with CW5 Brian Matthews. Oh, wow, I get to start. I feel special. Hey, how's everybody doing? Hey, I am, uh, like you said, I'm CW5 Brian Matthews. I'm the Chief Warrant Officer of the branch. I've been, <laughs> I've been in that position now uh, for about 30 days, so I'm learning, coming from proponent uh, and technical director of the schoolhouse, so plenty of years. Uh, over the past 10 or so years, I've had the opportunity to have a first row seat and see how cyber has evolved, uh, specifically from the Warrant Officer side of the house. I remember starting off uh, as an exploitation analyst and Sergeant, newly promoted Sergeant Gray was training me up to be an exploitation analyst. And he was by far the best analyst I had ever worked with. Um, when we looked at the team, we were filled with Department of the Army civilians, both on the um, uh, Department DOD civilians, Department of the Army civilians, as well as warrant officers, officers, and NCOs. And we all worked together. It was a pickup game. Um, I think as we look forward for the next 10 years, especially as warrant officers, we need to move away from the pickup game. And what needs to happen as warrant officers, we need to hone in on what we do best. And that's solve hard technical problems for the Army. Um, and with that being said, you know, the 170 Alpha on the cyber side, they need to be out there making sure that they are filling those senior and master work roles, tier one type work roles for our 170 Bravos. We need to be out there making sure that uh, we have uh, EW superiority when we move into conflict and for the 170 Deltas we need to be building capabilities to cover both uh, competition and conflict and that's kind of the focus of this panel we're going to be talking about what warrant officers could do to get to that next level in service 2030. so that's what I have for uh, myself and I'll move on to whoever's next thank you Chief, yep. uh, um, Chief Chris Resco. Oh, good afternoon everybody Probably a quarter of these people in the room probably already know me on a personal level, and everybody else probably has heard of me. Uh, I am the seventh regimental chief warrant officer of Signal. I've been in the seat since June of 21. I will be changing out next June. Any W5s are interested in, in my job, I'll share you with my continuity book, and you can compete. Just want to put that, that out there. I'd like to be able to have a, a good panel of people who would like to come in and, and lead the Signal Regiment as we continue the next part of our evolution. You know, right now, uh, we're finding out how to be better data enablers. Uh, and, and what I need now is for all of you to get a seat at the table with your command, with your S3, with whomever is planning exercises, whoever is planning the way ahead for that unit to, to get part of that conversation to see how we can better enable the data workforce. Uh, and, and I know that sounds like very nebulous, but we're starting to teach data literacy at the schoolhouse just as CAC is mandating by next summer that all the centers of excellence will be teaching data literacy. And what we're trying to do is get people to understand what that means to a signal ear. You know, we do have some name changes. You know, we have the data engineer for the 26 Bravo. They get a heck of a lot of education on that. Uh, we need to know what's the next steps once those people leave their PME, get out to their units, and find out do we have it right. And we need some candidate feedback. So potentially I might be coming to some of y'all's camps post and station in the next year and see if we got it right. Or we may be doing teams calls. It depends upon our budget. But uh, with that, enough about me. Um, I, I'm very fortunate. I have CB5 Willie Newkirk as a technical director of the Signal School, and I have Reba Walner here leading the proponency as we uh, have this change. Uh, so you may see some changes from AIT all the way up to the pre-command course as Willie is trying to make sure that the curriculums are in sync that we're not double stacking, doing the wrong thing. He's going to start leading the CTSSBs as we adjust critical tasks. So uh, when those surveys go out about your MOSs, make sure you answer them to make sure all those tasks are captured. It's no longer going to be, hey, I'm teaching it all at the Signal Schoolhouse. Everything else gets forgotten. We're going to lay out lesson plans for on-the-job training and for uh, self-development learning as well, back what we used to do uh, before we hit the war on terror. And, and we just had to adjust the schoolhouse. This is what you get trained on, and that's it. So with that, I'm going to pass it on to the next speaker. 
Thank you, Mr. Chief. Uh, CW5, Chris Everson. Slide on over. <laughs> I'm a CW5 Chris Everson. I'm at the uh, cyber proponent officer. I've been in the seat for about 30 days, um, learning the ropes, uh, uh, all the dot mill PF um, things that go along with that job itself. Um, before that, I was a CCWO at the Cyber Protection Brigade, cyber protection brigade that was a great job. Had about 141 officers underneath me. It was it was great working working the operations of uh, DCO. Um, I've done a, a lot of different things in a lot of different areas, so I won't be too long, but where are my CW2s and CW3s? Raise your hand. I need all of you all to start looking for your replacements as well. Start bringing up these NCOs at the, at the, at the, at the, uh, the, uh, the E5, looking at your E4s, getting involved in, in their career paths. So, we, so I don't know if any of y'all are going to stay in the next 20, 25 years or 30 years to help fix some of the problems that are going to come in the horizon. So you need to start identifying uh, top replacements now and start, uh, and start bringing those ones along so we can um, help them out and, and help yourselves out as well because you can't do everything by yourself. You're going to have to have some help. So um, with that, I'll pass on to the next one. CW5, Ramil Francisco. <laughs> okay. I thought we were going by height and I was going to be last. Because <laughs> according to the program, uh, Chief Wolin would go before me. So I really thought it was height or by age because, you know, I'm like, must be the youngest one. But my name is Ramil Francisco. I am the Army Reserve liaison here. I sit dual hatted doing signal and cyber proponent. I have a pretty unique experience. Um, before this, I was the senior battalion warrant at the Southwest Cyber Protection Center. Before that, I was at Office Chief of Army Reserve as the senior cyber technical warrant. And before that, I was at cyber school as an instructor, and then I was at HRC with Ms. Walner. So I've been all over the place. <clears throat> the Army Reserve, there's three categories. There's the Active Guard Reserve, Title 10, which is myself. I'm one of them. Then we have the Traditional Reservist, which is the Troop Program Unit. And then we have the IMA, the uh, Individual Mobilization Augmentee, right? So with those three, they're also managed three different ways. So the AGRs, like myself, were managed by HRC. The TPUs are managed by the Army Reserve uh, Careers Group. <clears throat> and the IMAs are also managed by HRC. So that alone poses some, some issues in managing them and how they, they do. And then, of course, we have the Army Reserve Proponent Advisors. I'm um, one for Signal, and I did one before when I was cyber. And, and we also have Chief Five, who is for the uh, cyber this time. I also brought two heavy hitters with me. I have the Army Reserve Com uh, Careers Group Career Manager Officer, which is uh, Chief Note, who manages the uh, TPUs. And then we also have uh, Chief Russell, who manages the, uh, the AGRs. So with that, the Army Reserve is a, a different breed, you say. It's, it's some of the individuals we have in the Army Reserve may not be in the right MOS, or I should say, they don't have the MOS that they do in the civilian sector. So myself, I'll, I'll use myself as an example. When I left active duty and went to the reserves, the closest unit we had only had a logistics MOS. So I became logistics. But in the civilian sector, I was a software engineer. And that's what got me to become a 251 Alpha initially. So the talent pool is there to draw on. We just got to find them. So I think uh, that's it. I'll, I'll go on later on with the questions. I turn the time back to you, Dave. <laughs> See you before you go on. Good afternoon, uh, Reba Walner. So I may have gone off script because I looked at the topics and I started thinking of what to say in regards to the topics. Um, so I want to talk about, you know, our talent man uh, acquisitions and uh, retention, but starting off with the, the fluid environment that we're living in. You know, right now we've got uh, a lot of positions out there that 
quite frankly, I'm not sure that we've got billets in the right seats uh, or MOSs in the right organizations. So I've actually already had, I've been in the seat for about 60 day, days now, and I've already had three or four people reach out to me about the uh, MOSs in the billets within their organizations. So what I would ask everyone in this room, you know, take a look at your own formation. Is, a 255 Alpha and a 255 November and a 255 Sierra the right fit for that organization? If not, please let me know. Does not mean I can immediately change it. Does not mean I can change it uh, because the billet owner has a, a, has a say in it. But I can try to help influence, all right? So I definitely need to be at least aware of uh, where we might not be properly structured. Uh, knowledge. you know. We are in an ever-changing technical uh, day and age. You know, it, it is changing faster than some of us are, are able to keep up. And so we're looking for those folks who have the ability to kind of glean information and really understand it and apply it in an effective manner. And so those are, in my opinion, the NCOs that we need to be honing and, and teaching and training and guiding towards a path as a warrant officer because they're going to be effective in trying to help influence and shape the, the Army as we continue to progress in this technical era. Um, I, I, the other part, you know, that was part of one of the main topics was retention. Um, Retention has obviously been a major challenge, especially for Signal Branch over the last five to seven years. Uh, you know, Chief Francisco, who, by the way, I do like to state as a Signal Warrant Officer, he's been an Alpha, a Sierra, is now a Zulu. His name is Cisco, but he was never in November. Um, but, <laughs> uh, sorry, plain joke. Um, retention has been an issue for quite some time. Uh, you know, at HRC, we were, during my time at HRC, we were pretty heavy on the W3 and the W4 side. So our promotion rates, our promotion competitiveness for the CW3 grade was exponential. We had a couple of years where, you know, 48 to 50% for 255 alphas, 52 to 55% for 255 Novembers. That's substantial. Those are hard numbers when we're talking about promotion. Uh, why do I bring that up in regards to retention? We have done a lot of work to try to shift the, uh, the year groups or the age in time and service of uh, the NCOs that are applying. Six to eight has been a more focused time frame. I will admit, I agree with that for some. Eight to 10 is probably the sweeter spot for the majority. I personally still believe we need some 10 to 12 and maybe even a couple 12, to, uh, 12 and beyond. Why? Our pyramid does not have room for all W-2s to make W-3. So I would like to try to shape the force so that we have natural attrition instead of inability to get selected for promotion attrition. All right, because those promotion rates going back to 2015, 2016, 2017, they're not better than you know us being completely depleted, our W-3 and W-4 ranks either. All right, so. With that, I think I've probably hit my three-minute mark. I'll turn it over, and I'm ready for questions to get fired. Thank you, Chief. Um, we have a few uh, questions uh, already prepared for each of the panel members to respond to. Um, once we get past those questions, we'll have uh, take questions from the audience. So uh, please be thinking about those while we get through these. Um, the first one, under the Army's transformation and contact efforts, how has signal and cyber adjusted or transformed the warrant officer recruitment requirements and accessions efforts? It, this is free fall now, y'all. <laughs> or I can call. A couple facts. I just want to let people know the number of people that we can bring into the warrant officer cohort is set by the Army G1. So even if I know I have an increase in my billets or my requirements, they're still going to be hard stop there because they have to blend it with all the other branches, bring in through a single pipeline, which is warrant officer to candidate school, uh, and then get them to their, their basic courses. So that is one thing that is set. Um, some of the ways that we're, and I'm not going to completely go into your, your sphere here, Reba, but part of the ways we're looking at is, you know, everybody says you need a security plus. Well, the Army, know, we know we have the 8140 requirement now, which means that you can be certified coming out of AIT. 
and we have that right now for 25 Bravos. That they actually have a, their, their graduation certificate qualifies them for some work roles uh, at the basic level according to the uh, DOD cyber workforce framework. So we have to look how we can apply that. Since not all MOSs, you, if you look on our website, all MOSs can apply, whether you're 11 Charlie or if you're from the Air Force or if you're in the Navy, you can apply. Um, and right now we only have 25 Bravos that are certified coming out the door. So we, we really need to take a hard look at that. Um, there is free training available for these certificates or your ability to get your SEC plus, but there may not be a voucher for you. You may have to go use your cool, you know, the, the, the credentialing online and all that. So we kind of have to navigate how we do that to bring in uh, new, new soldiers. But uh, I'll stop there because I did already get into your, your realm and uh, wonder if Cyber has some thoughts. All right, I'll jump in. Hey, so, so I think Cyber has been in a unique situation because we have been less restrictive than most because Signal has this long history, 50 years or something, and you all have a, a pretty set way of doing things where cyber kind of let us do our thing. And, and with that, we were able to be less restrictive. So we took folks that were, you know, we looked at folks that had unique skills. We looked for individuals that were that diamond in the rough. Additionally, um, unlike most MOSs, we have a very low NCO to warrant officer ratio. So you look at our NCOs, uh, it's specifically looking at our 170 alphas, for example. 170 alphas, uh, it's a two to one ratio. That means two NCOs for every one warrant officer position we have. That's, that's extremely lo low. When we look at the other MOSs and other branches, you're looking at an eight to tw 12 uh, NCO to warrant officer ratio. So we've had to be creative. And I think that's been a benefit for us because we've really been able to get some folks that, that brought a skill set. I mean, I've had 11 Bravos that, were, that had a computer lab when I was proponent in their basement. And then I looked at their resume, and I'm like, man, you haven't done anything cyber. And then they start, hey, let me send you my GitLab. Let me send you everything I've done. And I'm like, I don't know what half of that stuff means, right? Uh, <laughs> but, but we've been very lucky. On the one study Bravo side, I think we've had a really good pool. But even that, we've expanded. I mean, there was a time when we were only looking at people that had SEMA experience was a, a title we used to use for uh, individuals. Now we've delved into the 25 Echo realm, and we've grabbed folks that, the 13 series, we've grabbed folks that really bring a unique skill set, and we've allowed that, as long as you can show that you can do what it takes to become a warrant officer. I mean, we got one in the room, uh, 170 now for Ryan Paul. I know I'm calling you out, but uh, PSYOPs, right? Uh, civil, affairs. civil Affairs. We got a Civil Affairs. I mean, he, he left as either distinguished undergrad or undergrad when he graduated WOBC, and now he's a master host analyst, right? So, so we've been very lucky on our side of the house. So, so I will caveat on, on that. So I, I, I did a lot of interviews for, for individuals wanting to come over to cyber, and, and I remember one, one, one kid in, in particular, right? So I was talking to this kid and, you know, asking what his passion was, and, and that's my, my, first, my first question is, what is your passion? Well, well, the kid just wanted to be cyber because he understood some of the things that we did. He was creating Python scripts just to pick out his kid's name. I mean, that's, that, that is something that goes um, with what we look for in the, in the Warner score, somebody who's passionate about the job, somebody who's passionate wants to continue, continue to learn. So when we're, when we're taking the approach of trying to find those diamonds in a rough, yeah, maybe they don't have the necessary background or quote-unquote background we want as a, you know, the military experience, but maybe the person has been doing capture the flag since he was 12 years old. You just never know until you start asking these questions. So I'll leave it at that. As far as Army Reserve, I sit on both proponents, as, as I, I mentioned earlier. What I've noticed is um, most of the uh, first of all, the Army Reserve, we, we have a, with Compo 2, unlike Compo 1, our issue is retention, not retention, but recruiting. We have a recruiting problem, not so much with retention. Um, my goal is to capture all the Compo 1 leaving active duty <laughs> to join the Army Reserve or National Guard, <laughs> right? That's, that's actually a goal for us, right? Second, most of our warrants tend to stay longer. They're the crusty warrants, right? They're, they're in their 50s. Chief Gomes here, <laughs> right in front of me, they're in the, you know, they're, they, they tend to stay longer. And, 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 and the reason for that is, you know, they, they want to continue to serve. This is not their bread and butter, right? They, they come on the weekend, they do this. So that's, that's one. Um, 
the other is, uh, like I mentioned before, the MOS. Yeah, they might, uh, some of them may stay E4s, E5s. You know, I've, I've seen E4s for, they've been E4s for 10 years. But on the civilian sector, their actual, you know, cyber operators in the civilian sector or DOD, they do the job. They just don't apply. So they have the experience. They have the education. They have the qualifications. They just don't apply. So those are the ones we, we capture and look at. So let me, let me share some posture sheets, my numbers with you. So when it comes to cyber, as, as Chief here said, you know, Brian said, you know, the, the number when it comes to 17 Charlies going to 170 Alpha, the ratios, we don't have that. On the Army Reserve, it's the same way. My, my our enlisted is 63%, 17 Charlies, right? However, on the 25 Bravo, 25 Bravo E5, I'm 162% over strength. When it comes to E6, I'm 115. That's 25 Bravo. So there's a pool I can pull from to turn it into 255 Alpha. And my 255 Alpha right now is sitting at 59%, which is really low. And part of that, it was my fault also, because I was really recruiting them to go over to cyber when I was cyber. But now that I'm back in Signal, I'm trying to recruit them back to Signal. <laughs> so what do I do, right? But with the redesign, the brigade that we're having in the Army Reserve Cyber Protection Brigade, there's an increase of 114 warrants in the next three years with the approving, uh, with, the, with RSHA being approved. So that 98% for 170 Alpha will drop down to 50 some percent unless we recruit some more, right? So how do we recruit this? So that's one of the things I'm trying to do right now is I'm working with the officer of sessions NCO and every quarter I brief them on the difference between signal and cyber and one, what we look for proponent level in accepting them. And then we, we tell them what we need to do to, to get them accepted. I yield the time. So, I mean, with the acquisitions, I mean, one of the biggest challenges is, you know, we talk about it all the time, finding the right people, but they're out there. Um, and, and it's up to us, you know, regardless of W1, W2, or a senior warrant to help find those people. Uh, the, the reality is, like, I view it as some of this restructure, some of this reformation, transformation that we're, we're going through. Part of why I talked about making sure we've got the right billets in those uh, organizations is because, I mean, you let me know. I'd actually really like to hear from the audience for a moment. Uh, if, if I'm in a billet that I'm not satisfied with, if I'm not happy and I don't feel like my talent is beneficial, if I'm not necessary, I'm not satisfied. What type of, you know, how does that encourage me to continue to serve? How does that convince me to stay in and hope the next assignment's going to suit me better, right? So honestly, you know, raise your hand if you've been in a, a unit that you felt like you were ready to PCS or would retire if you could have, you know? It, it's, I think that is a challenge, right? So, so when we talk about retention, I, it's part of why I want that feedback. I think it's a challenge that we've got, and as we go through this transformation, we've got to make sure we do our best to get it right to help set the stage moving forward down the line. Thank you, Chief. Um, that leaves us just enough time for one more question before we get to the audience, and it leads us uh, uh, right into the actual next question, which is, how does Signal and Cyber handle talent management in order to get the right warrant officer with the right skills in the right job at the right time? Okay. So I told them, no, I told them all that I'd be the one to do all the tap dancing and take all the bullets. And so I'll, I'll start this off with talent management is a, a very um, admirable goal. And, and it's something that we get after with in little episodes. And it's because, if you think about it, frankly, HRC is in the strength management business. We're trying to help them become into the talent management business. And it's very hard because either there's not enough talent or you have too much talent and only so many bullets to put them into. When I talk to people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, when I say, how do you, you are, are you showcasing your talent to a prospective job, uh, I tell them, are you preparing your resume and aim? I can tell you right now, I think we're at the 20 percentile as far as AIM resumes being filled out. 
Uh, I also say, how are you preparing for your uh, engagement with the prospective job? Now, first off, we, we're going to recognize the fact that when we say strength management, that might mean that there are 20 available jobs but only five available movers, and the Army's going to prioritize where they need first. And so your talent may not fit into any one of those buckets just yet. And that's where you have to have conversations with your mentor and with HRC to try to find a goal because you may be able to take that dependent restricted tour, spend that year there, and then a job that you're more uh, suited for would be coming up next and you'd be able to compete for that. So I, I think you have to put your best foot forward when it comes to talent management. Uh, if you have any kind of training, make sure it's in your soldier talent profile uh, and you need to update your, your AIM resume. Uh, right now, I mean, when they can finally combine it and it's all into one, one system instead of having two separate, uh, it'll be a lot easier because you'll, you'll have your training records aligned with your, your resume and so forth. But right now, that is your, your best way because First thing I did when I was in the AIM process as a unit member, not as a person trying to get a job, was I, I saw the, the candidates out there for the job, and what did I do? I looked at their resumes. Back then, I got to see the orb in their resume. And I pulled those up, and I came, went to the G1, and I said, here are the top 10 contenders for this one job, in my opinion. And I told them, you, you're free to look at all the others, but these are the ones, and here's why, and we can talk about it later. So, and then we wanted to have the uh, people responsible for the position interview those they wanted to interview. So that's my little bit of advice there. Just understand that there's a diverse talent in the Army. That is true. Uh, but based upon Army priorities, there may not be the available billets to use that talent right now or at the time that you're moving. I just want to hop on to the resume piece real fast. You are all warrant officers. If you don't have a warrant officer as a reference, you are setting yourself up to be more challenged. All right. I am a senior warrant officer, and the moment I pull an ORB, although the resume, and there's not a warrant officer on your, your reference list, it, it sets me off. All right. It, it, I want to know what senior warrant is looking at you and talking about you and speaking on your behalf. I could be different in that opinion. I don't believe I am, but I highly recommend you have at least one warrant on your, that, that reference list. I also recommend you don't only have warrants on that reference list because I don't think that's helpful either. The balance of O grades, an NCO, senior NCO, acceptable, uh, but at least a warrant in a senior field grade uh, O grade is highly recommended. Now, I would also say when I was looking at all those resumes, half of them all had Major General John Morrison as a reference. Do you think that Lieutenant Colonel is going to call John Morrison and ask for his opinion on this W-2? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you have a relationship with one of our senior Army leaders, but put in reachable and accessible to the grade that is going to be evaluating you. If it's going to be a G6 at the signal command, it's an 06. Is he going to go to a one star? Maybe. He may know them, have a relationship, but he's more likely to connect with another 06 or maybe as a mentor to a lieutenant colonel. Uh, so be a little bit realistic on there. Uh, maybe if you're on the CG combo team, you may have that relationship, and then by all means, uh, make sure that General Morrison knows that. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I think it needs to be somebody that we can all reach out to because, as she said, it, it's a lot easier for us warrants to contact, whether it be a W-1, W-5. Uh, but uh, I, I think it's, that's something to consider when you put those references on there. And you don't have to limit it to that block of three to five. You, you can put some in the other blocks as well. Man, this, this is such a contentious uh, topic for me, right? So I'll say this. Warrant officers on the cyber side, we, we're a little different. Once again, I think our advantage is that we're a smaller group of individuals, so we can uh, really take time to do talent management. Uh, I, I will go as far as to say that maybe the AIM market for us uh, may have not as been as beneficial as it would be for another branch because we're a small branch. I mean, I think if you add out 170 Alphas, Bravos, and Deltas all together, we still wouldn't equal up to probably one of the 255 MOSs. I mean, I'm just, just being honest. So that's one. But I, I think the other piece is... Um, we as warrant officers got to remember what we have to do to make sure that we are the people that we're looking for. I think we don't have open and honest conversations. And I, I know this is the part that I know that's not the politically correct things to do. That's why I'm a CW5, right? I want to tell y'all the truth. We really need to have open and honest conversations. There are some people that are number one and there are some that's number 10. And we got to have that conversation. And I, in the cyber branch, we believe everybody is the number one. And everybody can't be, you know, and that's once every Alpha, once every Bravo, once every Delta. And I think as warrant officers, we got to do a better job of being honest with each other. We all know. We all know who's one through ten. We won't say it. And then, then when this ten 
gets to the number one position, we're like, what happened? Um, I, I think that's where it starts. I think that also starts with transparency. We got to be transparent, and that comes with self-awareness. We got to be aware enough to know that there's some skills that we got to get to get there to better our chances on talent management. There's always going to be leaders that you know pick those people based on peer records and reputation, and all. And we got to be realistic on the the, the I want to say the game that we play, but the environment. And we need to understand the rules of the environment to make sure that we're in the best position to set ourselves up not depending on purely just the aim and everything going the way it's supposed to go. I think that's the part that we, we really got to work on. So that's my part. Sorry. So I would, I would dovetail on that. So <clears throat> we also have to look at and say all CW3, all CW4 positions are not equal. Some take certain different soft skills, and we need to start identifying soft skills that go with different positions as well. Because if you're talking to senior leaders for most of your position, and you've been nothing, you have no type of training, no type of uh, uh, skill to be able to, to relate to the, to the senior leader and be able to translate what you do technically to a senior leader, the senior leader is not going to read a four-page paper. He's not going to do it. They're gonna, they need a summary. So if you're not used to doing that, then maybe you need to be able to acquire that skill set. But we also have to go back and say, hey, you don't have this skill set yet. And it, go, and it goes back about being transparent and being honest with people and telling them, hey, you're not ready yet for this level of position. However, this is how you get there. And so we, if we continue to do that, then we'll make each other better as well. And, we, and then we have to look at the positions. Are the positions where they need to be? You know, I can tell you that even on the cyber side, even though we're small branch, we don't always, we don't have it correct. We have positions that are probably not correct right now, but we'll, we'll go back and, and uh, we look at all and do the dot mil PF and find out where at least positions should be. If you're W3, W4, you probably should be in a position of influence somewhere. So you can start influencing the force. So you can start giving back and fixing those things that you saw as W1s and W2s. So I'll leave it at that. When it comes to Army Reserve, it's, it's pretty rough. <laughs> with talent management. As, as an AGR, you can PCS them. You know, I PCS every two years. But as a TPU or IMA, you can't force them. What if they don't want to go to a different state? What if they don't want to travel another two hours just to go do it on the weekend? I, I remember as a TPU, when I was TPU, I would drive nine hours just to drill on a weekend. And I'll drive overnight as soon as I get there in the morning, I'm taking the ACFT or the APFT. You know, I was college students. I, I'm okay. But it, it's rough. And so what we've done with this is um, the CAR, the Chief of Army Reserve back then, the guidance when I was an Office Chief of Army Reserve, the guidance was build the positions where they are. And with this redesign of our Army Reserve Cyber Protection Brigade, we, pl we place the the battalions in major cities. We placed them in Adelphi, Maryland, in the NCR region, so we can recruit there. We can recruit San Antonio, where I came from, right? Another big hub. And then Chicago, and then the other one is in Dublin, California. So we try to build them there. And then another initiative that we have for them is that we're actually paying for their lodging when they show up. And then, uh, at the same time, you know, they're in their flight. So we give them $500 to travel. So we, we, we try to give them incentive, incentive to, to do that. But it's really hard to position them where we really need them. It's more of an influence and mentorship. Because I know some people in the previous unit IK just came from in San Antonio, they've been there from W1 all the way to W4. And some of them been there forever. And you're shaking your head. You, you're probably one of them. <laughs> From private to W5 in one, one unit. So it's, it's really rough. So it's, it's really rough. So, but we are working on it. Yeah, so it's, it's rough, but we are doing that. And then another thing is what, you want me to move to a different location just to do exactly the same thing. So it, it's rough, but again, you know, we're... Oh, we're looking for solutions. But what they, where they shine is they, they have specific talent and, and skill set. You know, I have a CW3 that we mobilized at the CPB when he was a CCWO. He probably doesn't know, but that CW3 is a CISO for a Fortune 500 company. Well, I know. I know. Oh, he knows. You know, there's some of them that are like that. They just want to continue doing 
as being a warrant rather than doing something else. So it's, it's a love. Thank you, uh, all of you. Um, now, personally, I could go all day long asking them questions and having them teach me because they're far smarter than I am. But realizing that there are uh, more warrant officers in one spot than I've seen in a long time, I cannot imagine that there are not warrant officers out here that want to ask questions directly of them. So uh, with the last 20 minutes we got left, we're going to hand it over to y'all to ask questions of them that you have on your hearts and minds. And uh, because they're recording this, could you please speak into the mic when you're asking the question and then they can answer from their mics. Who wants to be first? I know there's somebody dying to ask a question. Hey, here we go. Thank you, Chief. Hey, no problem. Chief Mack, CCW from the 335th. Uh, I think the question was asked earlier and I, I think everybody, you answered to a degree in your functional or your area of expertise, but I would ask the panel again, what are you doing from your foxhole to prepare units in the downtrace for a multi-component uh, level exercise or readiness level uh, to support LISMO and LISCO operations, right? Some of it's structure, some of it's recruiting, retention, but from your foxholes, how are you integrating like cyber? You know, we've been to multiple exercises out at the, the CTCs, and I've yet to see a cyber response from the tactical side, right? How, how divisions are getting those simulations and how they're responding from the signal it's similar too, right? Like what are we doing to posture? And it's a challenge for me at my Fox, but from your side on the enterprise level, what are you guys doing to posture and get us ready to meet tomorrow's fight? Thank you. So did anybody go hear Colonel Wacker talk earlier? Yeah, yeah. So did he talk about MART or did he talk about C2 fix or did he talk about both? Okay. So we, he is our contribution to the future fight and helping us learn. Uh, you know, C2 Fix is a Department of the Army G6 led, well, Department of the Army led event, uh, not a CCOE led event, uh, but we do have feelers in there. And what we're trying to glean is, especially for our S6s, if you think about our 25 alphas, they're the ones that have to really understand the capabilities and the methodologies, the TTPs that they're learning. Uh, and we're, we're taking that back and taking what we can to inject into our curriculum. Uh, the technology piece, I, I can cover some concepts, I can do some education, but I can't cover that kit. Because you think about it, some of the kit is not yet really in the pipeline, or it's in small pipelines. Uh, so we can really go, go after education at that point. Um, what, I, what I'm also trying to do is, if you, anybody been on a land war net lately? You know, E-University? We have these things called start guides, have you seen those? where I can get a card on a specific piece of kit and maybe learn a thing or two about it. Trying to get some of that for some of this early kit that we have and say, well, why don't you invest a little bit into that? I know that we may deprecate that and it may not be here in two years, but then you just take the start guide away. So I'm just trying to get some of that and some resources to our school. So uh, two years ago, I went to the PM and I got all the documentation, all the new radios, what formations are going in, what waveforms they use, all the NSNs, all the ancillaries so you can get antennas and cables and all that. And I spread them out on the signal systems collaboration page and I gave it to the sergeant's major uh, for the signal sergeant majors and I gave it to our, uh, the AIT courses. So they have those resources available. Anybody here doing the exact same thing, trying to find a way of spreading information out? I, I hope you are, because I, I'm only one person, and I can only get it out. So if you find little, you know, little nuggets, start getting them out. You know, Teams is a great collaboration. Make sure that you, you put those things out. But when we're going through our doctrinal changes, now this is something we're trying to wrap our heads around. Doctrine is written for how we fight today. I'm learning stuff, or excuse me, the Department of the Army is learning stuff through Fort Campbell right now that's going to inform our future doctrine. And, and my question is, why can't we write that now? And their answer is because our doctrine is for how we fight today. So that's something we're trying to navigate. Maybe we can get TRADOC to change some things and make it to where we are going to be aiming our doctrine towards the fight that we're building for 20, uh, 2030. Um, that way people can start practicing now. Because, you know, doctrine is not proscriptive. It's just a way. So um, I think that's uh, one of the challenges we're going to take on. It's going to require more stars than I work for, probably to make that change, but we're going to push forward on that. So I say from the cyber side of it is we look at the, the, the FDU, the force design updates, and ensure that when those, those things come around, those meetings happen, that we're in the room with them because 
they are designing, like, let's take, for example, we have Levis Cyber. Well, guess what's coming online? 12 Cyber. So what is 12 Cyber going, going to do? What is their mission going to be? So we are asking these questions now so we can prepare for the future. Because if you tell me I just would need a bunch of 170s out there, that doesn't pass the muster. Because what do you need? What, what capability are you trying to fill? So we ask those questions in those important means when we're talking about um, doing the FDUs and doing the doctrine, doctrine as well. So we have to be in the room itself so we can prepare for the future fight. I'll add one more piece to that. I think when we look at the talent management piece, too, that plays a huge role. I see this a lot in the EW community. We've been doing a great job of putting the right people in the right place at the right time to inform the senior leaders so they're not out there making decisions without the, the, the expertise. You know, I, I think I saw Mo in here. I see Chief Easton is here is at our cyber. We have the right people with the right skill sets being able to inform. So I think when we in the past, we've kind of lacked that. And I know, especially on the EW side, we're working through KID and, and a whole bunch of other things. But um, now that we have those people in place, I think now that we can, we, we can kind of start seeing and uh, answering some of those questions. Do you really need a, a, a EW person? Do you need a cyber? I, I remember being a proponent and getting jacked by a, a unit because they were like, hey, your guy has done nothing for me. And I was like, who is it? Is it an Alpha or a Bravo? And they're like, what's the difference? So it's like, uh, that tells me right there where, where we were. And I think that was, that was five years ago. I think we're so further, uh, far away from that. And, and I think talent management plays a, a role. And I think from, uh, definitely from the CWAB, the regimental, that, that's a huge part of our job, making sure we have the right people out there in form. Because we can't be everywhere all the time with all the different commanders, but you all can. So we got to make sure we understand what you bring to the table and put you in the right place to be successful and help those commanders. Uh, my name is CW4 Scott Pfaff, and this, selfishly, is for the uh, cyber warrant officer's question. Uh, so you mentioned, you know, essentially being honest about evaluations 1 through 10, and this question leads to that is, where do you see the warrant officer responsibilities and roles for the cyber branch? Specifically because we have a unique position where we have 170 alphas, when our roles in OCO and DECO are so drastically different, it is very, very hard to quantify what we should be doing. And we get to this problem where it's very difficult to say that someone is good at something when we haven't clearly defined what their roles and responsibilities are, especially because we have a lot of NCOs doing the same things that our warrant officers are doing. Oh, man, I knew you were going to ask a question like that. I should that have kept, yeah, I should have, yeah, that should have been in the parking lot. No, uh, uh, no, that's again, I'm just messing with you. Great question. Hey, uh, uh, so, so we got to remember what the core job of a warrant officer is, it, despite the role, right? And, and really, we are the technical death. Okay, so whatever role you are, whether you're an EAI on, uh, host analyst, your EW technician, it's about technical depth. Now, I do believe that we have to better define what is the warrant role, because I believe in the past we played a pickup game. The best qualified person, if you're NCO, your officer, you're going to fit the mission. I think I said that at the beginning. That was 10 years ago. Moving forward, we have to really streamline what the warrant officer does. I, I would challenge and say I do think we have done that to an extent. You know, on the, uh, yeah, I think on the OCO side, we're clear. If you are a warrant officer, you're likely an EA, ION, or two developer. It's pretty clear. I mean, most of us are not going down the DNA, DNA route. We're not doing the TAR. The cyber plan is additional thing. Mission commander is a different thing. On the DECO side, we got host analysts and network analysts. And talking to the senior warrant officers here, we really want you to be a senior and master. And now we're looking at your tier one, work, tier one work roles, ASO and data engineer. So I think we're getting there. Do, do I believe we, we probably need to, you know, to steal something from Travis East and some stratified path to say that, hey, you know, you need to be a, these are your core skills, this is whether it's an analyst, ION, uh, whether it's a, you know, OCO, DECO, we, we got to kind of figure out that piece. We're not there yet, but I think we're a little closer. I don't know if, uh, uh, if uh, Sean Beauvais and OCC is in here, but to get after that, what we're doing, uh, specifically in, in the cyber school is we're looking at a .mail PF in October and November to get after that, to say, hey, what does this look like and what can we do to fix this, specifically with the warrant officers and looking how the NCOs feed in that. Because let's say we, uh, listen, 
Chief Matthews is not saying we're dividing MOSs. Let's be clear. But if we were to look at different MOSs, how would that affect the 17 Charlies? How would that affect the 17 Alphas that are expected to do both 17 Alpha and 17 Bravo? How do we delineate that piece? So I think there's some work to be done. I think we're a little better. But, yeah, I, I think you're right. We got to kind of stick in those lanes. And I think it's definitely on the OCO side. I think we're, we're there with EA and ION. My opinion is that if you're a warrant officer, you should be a senior. As a new warrant, you could be a senior. But we should be having all of the master roles for all of your Tier 1 work roles. That's Brian's opinion, you know, so. So, so Scott, just, just, to, just to be fair, I know the position you're sitting in, it's not an easy position. So what we have to do, especially from your, from your foxhole, because it's going to change each person, each iteration that comes behind you is going to change the position. So we have to be able to be able to be flexible going forward. So what, from where you said now, continue to make those recommendations, continue to make those changes. This goes for everybody in the, in the room. So whenever you see where you're sitting at and see what changes can be made, continue to send those up to the proponent, through your, through, your, um, through your senior school, cyber school, so we can start looking at what should be happening. Because again, what I did in your position five years ago is not relevant today. So again, we have to continue to evolve. And so you're in the right position to start doing it, start looking at it, and bringing up those behind you as well. This is, uh, I'm, I'm Chief Carr, I'm with the 505th TTSB, and um, based on, I want to build on the last question, I want to kind of give it to Reserve and National Guard. Do you think that the, what was just discussed is really a good model for what the Reserve and Guard experience where the E5 that may, uh, you know, be an E5 for 10 years, 15 years, but it's probably your most experienced cyber talent that you have on a team that exceeds the warrants, that exceeds the officers, or you have an officer, it, it, you know what it is, it is a pickup game. And when you talk about, uh, you know, give the example, hey, we had a CW3 that got mobilized, he's a CISO of a, uh, of a Fortune 500 company, okay, did we put him in a position that was CISO-like to take full advantage of the skills, okay? So given what was answered, what do you think the answer is for the Reserve and National Guard in that sense? Well, that CISO question, I have to defer to the CCWO at that time or what he did to that individual because he was a CCWO. But the challenge that I have and I, I, I've had with, with the, the Army Reserve population when I'm talking to whether it be warrants currently or MCOs or E4s with the background and experience is really some want to stay where they're at. It's, it's not, I, I can't force them to do what I think it's best for them. It's what they want to do. It, it's, it's hard because a lot of them will say, well, you know, I, I may be a CISO, but when I come on the weekend, I don't want to, I just want to come and serve and I want to be with my fellow soldiers. That's it. I don't want to do that. So. But we're not always on weekends. It, it's not always weekends when you, when you mobilize. So yes. So the way, and I'll talk to cyber since you mentioned that. On the cyber side, we mobilize two teams here every year, the Cyber Protection Brigade. And, and before mobilizing here, they do what's, they, they fill up the baseball cards. And when they get here, they get cannibalized. The team gets cannibalized, right? They, they get the talent and they put the talent where they need to go, right? And they, and they do that. So Chief Gomes, I can deflect to Chief Gomes as well because he came here and as a, as a reserve mobilized here, he stayed here for two years. And he, he, he also took over a, what, 1st Battalion? Yep. Yes. See, yeah, Senior Warrant. So yeah, he came here, but he became a 1st Battalion Senior Warrant. So. So the key word with Instantly, when we're talking about cloud uh, data uh, engineers and analytical support, we did the baseball card. We said, hey, we're coming in. I had from E5s to E2s to some were just going to be on lawnmower duty, depending how they filled out their baseball card. But we instantly took CPT-153 and made them a cloud team 
because we had officers that worked for Amazon, uh, Microsoft, and so forth. Instantly, boom, the reserves, the Compo 2 and 3 made that team up. So um, I, I hate to say it because this is more of a warrant officer thing, but what we're really after in this nation is bringing the best, mi best minds and best, ta best talent to face the issues that we're dealing with today. I had an E5 that came out of MIT, right? Big brain on Brad, right? How do you do that? You do that unselfishly. You try to put them in the right places, but just like Ramil said, you can't force these people to do it because some people just want to be in that row. But at the same time, across the board, up and down, we have to look at the best and, and able to get them on the battlefield. I think you have a PhD, right? I think, yeah. Right? As, he's one of the first guys when the war is coming in here, right? But he's happy where he's at. But there's people that have higher things, so let's just be humble, put the people in the right places, regardless of the cohort, and, and just do that. So that's the best way I did it with two years with uh, Chief Lucy's uh, uh, a way of really helped me understand how we put the best people in place. Over. We got time for one or two more. So I'm Chief Brooks, so I'm your Army National Guard Senior Signal Advisor up at NGB in uh, Virginia. So I manage right now. We've been using a lot of our time to rebuild the warrant officer cohort. So at one time we had three soldiers, AGRs, just kind of like their reserve counterparts, we're Title 10 AGRs from different states. So we still belong back to the state of Colorado. We have recall rights for any kind of mobilization for our state. So we're borrowed manpower working at a national headquarters from all the different states. My mission for the last about year and a half has been taking three AGRs and building it up to 22. So we have increased our warrant officer population at the National Guard side. What we do is when we, ha we can't get the talent because we have the PhDs and all these guys working for these civilian companies is we bring some of the junior warrants that's just got a basic course. So anybody, um, how many National Guard do we have actually? So we just have only a handful, but Mr. Roman is our counterpart. He's actually retiring. That's why we don't have National Guard representation up front. Um, I just came out of knee surgery, so I wasn't quite on the panel yet. But what we're trying to do is grab those civilian skill sets, elastic, for scout. And so we tap into the civilian sector with our National Guard soldiers, and we beg, borrow, and steal, put them on ADOS orders or a one-year order, maybe sometimes two. If we're lucky, we get to keep them as AGRs, but we borrow that manpower from the civilian sector. They come in, they train the troops here on how the civilian sector is working it. We make our place better, and then we start pushing that out through WOPD. So we're trying to get it out. I know a lot of times when we push things out, it goes through like a G3 channel or G6 channel or all these different boards on teams. Unfortunately, a lot of our junior warrants are sitting at the unit levels. So they may not get that information. So a lot of our stuff through the National Guard goes through word of mouth. They're like, hey, man, I know about this WOPD. Then we start asking the younger warrants, hey, what do you need to know? Who, who is your warrant officer now? Your biggest advocate is, are your, is your warrant officers. If I can't get an answer, I remember who my Compo 2, Compo 3, Compo 1 folks are. And I'm like, hey, man, how are you guys doing that? Not that I need to know the answer, but I can pass the answer to him now and then make that connection. So we call it the Warrant Officer Net. We use it all the time in the National Guard. Um, so if you guys have questions, you guys don't want to be in the reserves, I only go PCS within the state if you're AGR. So if you like a state and you want to stay there, <laughs> we could just keep you in a state. We don't have to go across lines. We don't pay for hotels, but, you know, we have mountains. <laughs> active duty, we always like active duty, too. So as long as you're not old and crusty like me, uh, we could take you too. We're not a 20 and out, so I've got 32 years of service. Husband's got 41. We're here for a long time, so if you guys still like to serve, call me. I'm broke. I have cards. <laughs> Depending on how loaded the question is, I got time for one more. Or they got time for one more. Here we go. I don't know if this is relevant. Uh, this is Chief Muniz. Uh, Sam, I go by Sam. I just want to wonder if there's going to be changes on the next FYI or maybe in, in the near future for some of the advanced courses in ILE for the force here in the signal, in the, you know, in the signal community. Uh, I just recently completed WOAG, you know, and it's, it was very still kind of basic kind of structure. Uh, there wasn't that, that challenge, right? All your expectations were too high coming out of the 82nd with different type of technology. And, and, and the schoolhouse and the advanced course are still very, very basic. I was just wondering if, if any of you have a feedback on 208, we're going to change some of that in the near future or in the next five years. Okay, again, I'm here to uh, take all the bullets and to, <laughs> so uh, let's be honest and frank. 
we train to make the just good enough warrant officer. And why do we do that? Because we have limited time because the units want their, their talent back. They don't want to lose, lose you forever. Now, as far as the courses, I mean, I, I'm sure if you talk to 255 no members, they'll, they'll tell you that first phase in the advanced course is not a cakewalk. Um, and, and it's just because it's the nature of that material. And for our alphas, I will say that it does depend upon your experience, your experience level. Uh, and what we're really trying to do is uh, step it up just a little bit, but I can't get too far ahead of the class. Uh, and, and some people are going to excel at that better than others. Uh, so, um, frankly, we, when we made the 255 Sierra a, 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 a sessions MOS, we stole hours from the basic and advanced courses of the other MOSs. So we did lose some of that curriculum time. That is some of our reps and sets and some of the rigor that we had to take away. Um, and, and that's why I brought it back to when I mentioned what Willie Newkirk's challenge is going to be, is to identify those tasks that we had to let go. Uh, and then uh, have a continuous conversation. Once people are trying to do this OJT stuff, I mean, if you think back, when I was 31 Fox, I learned how to do a SEN, I learned how to do a node center, I learned how to do a 39 Delta. I did not learn how to do a generator or put up a nine meter mast. Tasks that were, I needed to be able to do, but they you, you were trained on an OJT. And there was actually a list that showed those tasks. And, oh yeah, there were also lesson plans for that. We don't have that anymore. So what we need to do is have an ongoing conversation with our technical director on what are those tasks that we need to train a home station? Are those the right tasks because I don't, I'm not equipped for it? And what can I take away from the schoolhouse instead to put back in? So it, it is a tough question because I, I don't, in a resource constrained environment, our higher headquarters are not going to be in the business of giving us resources. They're going to be asking us to do less. So uh, it, it is a tough balance. Now, did you do your end of course critique? Were you very vocal in it? Okay, and the reason why I ask is when I did my end of course critiques back in 2003, they were completely ignored. And I, was, I had to lose a, a, a part of a four-day week again to come in and learn from a day civilian who wrote the dang joint manual on the piece of equipment that I was being trained on that the Army had only one in the inventory that was operational. And they continued to teach it again for five more years. Uh, when we had new leadership in the Senior Leader Devel Development College come in, he said, I'm going to these end of course critiques and we're going to affect change. If he saw something three times, it had to be actioned on. And I think we're continuing to do that change. Uh, with, and it's sad to say with the 255 Alpha, I did an end of course critique and they gave us all glowing reviews. And I think Mr. Henry stood up and said, okay, so you're saying that you are 100% prepared to take on the challenges in your first duty assignment. And they all were like, yeah. Well, Chris Westbrook stood up and said, that's great to hear. Glad we got it right. The next class is having the new curriculum. It went down from 32 weeks to 21 weeks. So I'm telling you, we, we are challenged on, on this. So your feedback is, is highly valuable. As you get out in the field, if you see some, some things, some trends, especially at the division and core level, as we transform, send us the feedback. Uh, Mr. Newkirk has an email inbox. I have an email inbox, and so does Ms. Walner. So please send us that, that feedback, and that we can get that back through. Um, this next round of CTSSBs, and I hate using the term, it's one of those bingo card ones, is absolutely critical. Because we do have to affect change for 2030, and we need to do it now. But because it is a, if we need resources, it's going to be a three-year process in order to get that change. Maybe two, if we can get it rushed through. But um, I don't like answering that question, but I have to give you the God's honest truth on it. I'd like to throw in a couple additional comments. So we had uh, the cyber warrant back there. I apologize. Um, Faf, uh, Chief Faf, who asked the question about you know 170 Alpha specifically with regards to how various the roles can be. Guess what? 255 Alpha is our most generic MOS for the signal warrants. And so I didn't chime in then. You've now opened the door for me to chime in now on this. The challenge that we have is we've got to prepare you for the variety of 255 Alpha that bullets that we've got out there. You could be typically more W1s or D junior W2s, a SAS mode. You could be a services tech. You could be, you know, actually on the servers. You could be an advisor in, in some uh, organization. It's a wide gamut. And so that adds to the complexity of what to teach to help you be prepared as you depart the schoolhouse to go off to those assignments. And, and you know, I don't have an immediate solution. You know, Chief Westbrook just talked about how much more condensed it is, and that creates additional challenges to teaching a broader sp uh, scope. Uh, so, you know, he talked about the CTSSBs right at the end. 
100% crucial, as he stated. It, it just, we cannot rely upon that feedback enough. Um, but I will tell you, like, one thing I am actually really wondering what we might need to do is do we need to pair and more so refine 255 alpha? It used to be two MOSs. I don't know that we have the requirement for two MOSs anymore, but do we need to better refine? Because I hear it all the time. I'm a W1. Why am I not going to work on servers? It's not the only job we've got out there. 255 Alpha is not a server tech. Services was the old title. Very specific difference. All right. So just we've got to teach for that broad, wide gamut. Thank you, Chief, and thanks to all the Chiefs up here. Um, before we get to a round of applause for everybody, I was asked to uh, throw out an admin note. Um, for those, how many active duty in here? Okay, how many people are worried about the board? Results? All right, Milper 24, 348. The board results have been delayed until further notice. <laughs> so, uh, with that, uh, please a round of applause for our fantastic panel members. <laughs>